Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Colton, co-executive producer of the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest, coming to you from Seattle, Washington today. And I'm really excited to be here for this conversation on engaging younger demographics in climate change and climate action. I'm delighted to have four amazing guests with us today who are going to be sharing their experience and their strategies and their research to help us really understand the opportunities and the mandates um, as it relates to our topic. So thank you for being here today. A couple quick notes. Um, first of all, um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a button for closed captioning if you would like to be able to enable that. And second, well, the chat is going to be closed today for participants. Um, the Q&A is definitely open. So please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions. And we will be entertaining them as possible throughout our presentations today. And then we'll save a little bit of time at the end um, for some of those questions too. So please participate um, in our conversation. Um, I'm going to introduce our four guests and then we've got a little poll for you as we get started to understand who you are and who's in the room as well. Um, I'm going to introduce our four guests and then we've got a little poll for you as we get started to understand who you are and who's in the room as well. Um, so to introduce our guests briefly, um, Rabbi Laura Rumpf recently joined the Jewish Family Service here in Seattle as their Jewish educator, but prior to that, um, she was a rabbi working with teens at Peninsula Temple Beth El in California and is going to share her experience there. Shana Morrell is the Springboard Fellow at Syracuse Hillel, who's sharing her experience both as a recent college student herself, as well as her work on a college campus currently. Aviva Paley was the co-founder of Kitchens for Good, has been consulting with nonprofits. She's also a board member of the Climate Action Campaign and a Just Transition Committee member at the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance. And for our purposes today, um, she's going to be talking in her role as the Innovation Incubator Advisor for the Jewish Community Federation of San Diego. And she's joined by Ali Ben, who is the Director of Philanthropy and Social Impact at the Jewish Community Foundation of San Diego as well. So thank you to our four guests for being here. Um, Jake, if you could put up the poll real quick, we would love to know who's in the room. Um, so please let us know uh, what role you're coming to our conversation from, um, either your particular role or the setting that you're in. I know you can only choose one. You might actually fit in multiple of those categories. So just pick the one that you feel like is most descriptive or relevant to you. Um, it's helpful to know where you're coming from and what your interests um, and questions are today as we frame our comments. So go ahead and take a moment to fill out that poll as we get started. Um, and in our conversation today, we're going to be talking both about the why and the how of engaging young, younger demographics um, and generations in climate action. I'm assuming that if you're here at the Big Bull Jewish Climate Fest, you know that climate action is an important thing. So our focus today is really going to be on how we can use this as a Jewish engagement strategy. And I'm particularly interested in this question because I think it's important that we're walking the walk of our values. We know that climate action is incredibly important to younger demographics. And if you've had a chance to be part of any of the sessions over the past several days led by the Jewish Youth Climate Movement, um, you'll know that there's some real intense, urgent, heavy feelings going on for these demographics. My kids are 14 and 17, and so I hear them talk about it all the time, that they are inheriting a world, an earth, an economy, a society that is really challenged by some serious things. And they need to know that we're also taking it seriously and that we're helping them raise their voices to make real change. This is not a, a theoretical social issue anymore. This is, as we know, and we've seen our earth burning literally and figuratively over the past several years, um, a particularly urgent and important question to take action on now. Um, so we'll see the results of that poll. And um, we have a lot of Hillel people, a lot of synagogue folks. Um, and some good representation from federations and community foundations too, um, and educators. So thank you so much for doing that. We can um, close the poll and we'll now move into our first question, which is, um, 
why does this matter? Why is this an effective engagement strategy and, and why are you doing this work? Shana, would you like to kick us off? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Shana Morell. I use she, her pronouns. I am currently on Nipmuc Indigenous Land and I am the Social Justice Springboard Fellow at Syracuse Hilla. So the why. Um, college is a unique opportunity where students are navigating their Judaism on their own for the first time in their lives. And we, we at Hillel recognize this and we're working to provide a range of opportunities and experiences so that students can explore different ways of being Jewish, different points of connection. This sometimes includes more religious programming, social programming, and where I fit in the justice programming. It's important that we meet the moment and we meet our students where they're at. They're coming to college, each one of them at different points on their journeys. Some of them may have grown up on a farm and are sustainability majors, but have never felt connected to Judaism. Whereas others may have grown up Jewishly engaged and active, but are unfamiliar with the climate movement. There's no one straight path or right way of being Jewish. And there's also no one right way of being involved in climate action. As college students with newfound independence, there's no way that they will show up if they don't genuinely want to be there. So it's important not to have expectations, not to force any content, but rather to support and empower them with the resources and the opportunities to learn and grow on their own time. By doing this, we are empowering our students to use this critical moment in their college journeys to create their own meaning and to take action on their own timeline and their own terms. And that's how they will be truly engaged in this important work. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Rabbi Laura, would you like to go next? I would love to. Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm a rabbi in transition. I've most recently been um, in the Bay Area serving a really wonderful congregation, Peninsula Temple Bethel in San Mateo. And I am now in a culture shaping role in the Seattle Jewish community. And I love that a common thread in my work already is this passion for multi-generational justice work and community, and particularly uh, following teens' leads in climate justice engagement. There are a lot of issues that keep me up at night. Um, maybe some of you can relate. Um, but when it, when it comes to the issue that most mobilizes and engages an incredibly diverse cross section of community members, climate justice rises to the top um, in part because everyone is implicated. Um, that's part of why it keeps me up at night. It's a big and overwhelming topic. Um, and it's so clear that we're not going to move the needle um, when we operate in generational silos or institutional silos. Um, so the flip side of everyone being implicated is that we are all integrated in collective change. Um, and as a rabbi, that feels like an incredible rally cry um, and one that really resonates at this time because we are calling together a community where you know we're all standing at Sinai and we're hearing a call in our own way. Um, and our teens um, are particularly hearing a sharp call at this time um, to to make a difference, to make an impact around climate justice and also to be joined um, with resources, with genuine support, with um, openings for leadership from those of us in generations who have um, who are who are doubly implicated um, in where we are as a climate justice movement. They are calling on us to join them um, and to create a bridge. And so I think that um, on a positive note, there are so many opportunities to come together um, across generations and to feel equally um, excited about acting together. And also, you know, as Shana mentioned, there's a diverse way, there's a diverse range of ways to engage. Um, so whatever time commitment you have, however you are immersed um, in climate justice and however you feel that connection to the land, um, there's a, a doorway in for, for you to be a part of really inspiring collective action. Um, and that, that's why I feel moved to do this work. Fantastic, thank you. And I think when I see rabbis really committing to this work, it to me makes Judaism and Jewish community and our collective power as a community feel so much more um, purposeful and authentic that we're not 
perpetuating Judaism for the sake of perpetuating it, we're showing that Judaism actually is a structure and a toolbox to deal with like the biggest existential and real crises of our time. And one of the things I love about the Jewish people is we have a very long history of really major crises that have happened to us and different models of leadership for how we've tackled that. And um, we see that whether it's the exodus from Egypt or the temple falling and reinventing rabbinic Judaism or people being dispersed and writing down the oral Torah to make the Talmud, we have a series of being able to confront these kinds of really major systemic changes with creativity and passion and collective power. And we see that happening today. Um, so thank you for that. Um, awesome, Aviva, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Aviva Paley, and I use pronouns she, her. Um, so as a young Jewish adult, um, or really as any human living on this earth, I think it's uh, pretty undeniable to recognize that um, climate change is the largest, most existential threat facing, um, facing my generation, facing our community. And it's something that for younger people, we've grown up knowing about this issue and it's really at the forefront of um of our minds in navigating through the world and as we go about um engaging with different institutions whether that is you know your synagogue or your community foundation or even shopping um i think that for younger generations we're so we're looking for organizations and institutions that are aligned with our values and looking for ones that are showing up in meaningful ways um, to fight for what we believe is right. And I think that our generation is also very attuned at spotting what I would call greenwashing of kind of um, saying that, yeah, we, we want to fight the fight against climate change, but aren't showing up in meaningful ways. So I think that um, for institutions to engage really wholeheartedly um, and meaningfully is a really important engagement tool to attract younger generations um, who want to make sure that their institutions are aligned with their values. For sure, that's super important. And I will also add one of the reasons why we have focused the theme of the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest this year on investing in solutions and pulling away from things that perpetuate the problem is exactly to have that incredibly actionable focus because the, oh, climate change and, you know, we should all be doing things to make it better without actually some rigor and strategy and organizing behind it does ring hollow to the people who are educated and who are feeling the, the urgency of it. Thank you for, for punctuating that. Um, Ollie. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so in addition to being the um, director of philanthropy and in engaging young adults in philanthropy here in San Diego, I also used to be a Hill director um, at a particularly challenging campus. So I can kind of speak to this question uh, wearing multiple hats and, and piggybacking off of um, both what Shana and uh, Rabbi Laura said, um, you know, younger Jews are aware of the privilege they have. And at the same time, they want to use that privilege to be drivers for positive change. Um, so they want to be welcome into the intersectional spaces where the tough challenges and tough societal issues are being discussed. And they'd also like their non-Jewish friends to feel comfortable in Jewish spaces. Um, so in some, they are much more universalist than particularist, uh, meaning they want to bring their Jewish values into sec secular spaces and vice versa. So by leading and joining together on things like climate change, um, it's so important to show why Jews should be part of the discussion on big societal problems. And it's important because young Jews want to show that it's an important part of who they are and their values. Awesome. Um, so I know that you've done some research um, on this particular demographic. Would you like to educate us a little bit about what you've learned as we move into the next phase of our conversation? Sure. Let me 
Let me just share my screen really quick. Um, so um, we've hit on some success in San Diego with a fundraising initiative called Give4. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that and why it's relevant to climate work in a sec. But um, I just want to introduce you to some of our research and um, findings about the expectations of young adults and young donors in particular. Um, and I think it's important to, as you sort of formulate ideas around uh, climate. Um, and I'll, I'll just caveat this by saying, you know, these are big picture ideas and none of these findings are going to be earth shattering um, on their own. Um, but when you put them together, you can create some interesting outcomes um, that uh, we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, so let's talk about some trends. Um, first of all, young adults really care about issues, about causes, um, rather than institutions. They're not loyal to particular organizations, and they're not giving, you know, the, in terms of philanthropy, they're not giving to the Federation, symphony or opera year in, year out in the same way their parents did or grandparents did. They see problems and they want to solve problems irrespective of which particular institution or organization is solving those problems. Um, second, they are, we all are completely overwhelmed with the amount of information out there, um, but critically they value help sifting through that information and they actually value curation as long as they trust the source of that curation and that there's some transparency around the process of that curation. And the example I like to give of this is um, Wirecutter, the, the review site from the New York Times. So if you need to buy a new phone or dishwasher or whatever it is, um, they will explain to you in detail, this is the process we went through and these are the ones that we're recommending. Here's why, here are the other ones we looked at, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows if they're actually the very best products, but they've been very transparent in how they've gone through their process. And so people really value that, that sort of help and that, that curation to sift through the information overload. Um, and then when it comes to giving, because obviously, um, you know, any part of a climate movement is going to involve some kind of fundraising. Uh, so I think it's important to think specifically about giving. And, you know, the younger demographic is thinking very broadly about what giving means and what philanthropy means. It's less about the tax, tax benefits of giving to a registered nonprofit. Um, it's much more, you know, the, the two big trends that have come up recently. One is, um, you know, direct financial support, um, but you can think of GoFundMe campaigns or, or there's some interesting statistics from Zelle about just the amount of direct financial support that people have brought, uh, people have given to other people, I think three quarters of millennials. Um, have given in some way to friends, families, or, or nonprofits direct financial support. Uh, and the other big trend that's arisen is these um, informal mutual aid networks. So whether that's running errands for you know, el you know, elderly neighbors or buying groceries for hard hit families, or just lending your goods and services, um, these important informal community networks have been able to move a lot quicker and more effectively than traditional nonprofits. Um, so, just to kind of sum up everything that I've said so far, I'd just say there's a lot less rigidity and a lot more fluidity in how young adults view how they want to contribute and make uh, impact in their part of the world. And that can be scary, um, or it can be, you know, a real opportunity for, um, you know, seizing this wide open space. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of green space ahead that can be taken advantage of. Um, so that's values, but what about their expectations of, you know, how they want to contribute and what they expect out of uh, that con those contributions. Um, so a really important trend is peer leadership. Um, and you can view this in, you know, one of two ways. You can view it as a move away from institutions and centralization, uh, or you can view it as, um, you know, the younger generation is understanding more that collective change comes through engaging peers and being able to effectively relate on the same level. Um, and however you view it, the key idea is that younger donors want to learn from their peers, want to share, want to feel part of a movement uh, towards change. Um, they're much less likely to feel satisfied if a relationship is purely one way or purely transactional. Um, next point is just about, you know, this seems really obvious when you're engaging a tech native generation, uh, but when you're thinking about climate work, you know, think about 
Uber or Venmo and how they've removed so much friction from the process of calling a cab or sending payment to somebody? And have you really removed all the pain points um, that get in the way of get people getting involved, people giving, people volunteering their time? Um, how do you make you know, every process as frictionless as possible? How do you really leverage social um, and how do you leverage the fact that there's, you know, kind of no privacy anymore and everything is public, whether that's giving, whether that's, you know, volunteering, sharing information. Um, it, it's really powerful and it's something that people sort of in, intuitively know, but aren't necessarily thinking through how it implicates all the work they're doing. Um, and then just finally, you know, people need to see the impact of the work they're doing. Um, they believe they're a force for good. Uh, they have a desire to make social change um, core to how they live their lives. And, you know, there's such an opportunity through social channels to provide content and to create discussions. Um, so it's really important to think about how you are um, create showing the impact and reinforcing people and then creating those viral loops as you go. Um, so um, I think Lisa, I, I'll stop there rather than talking about um, give for specifically unless unless you want me to dive in. But that's sort of the the big picture overview. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Aviva, any additional flavor you want to add to Ollie's comments about your particular community in San Diego? What are the strategies that you're seeing activate people and, and what does your demographic really care about in this? Um, sure. You know, I think Ollie really touched on the key pieces that yeah. our demographic is looking for. Um, a lot of transparency and a real focus on um, a real focus on the issue at hand. Um, and I think namely, you know, for for young adults who perhaps haven't dedicated their career to working specifically in the climate industry, there's a lot of, uh, there's a question of how can I help? How can I um, support on such a massive issue? And I think that um, we often turn to the institutions that we trust um, to help provide some of those answers. And I think, you know, with having um, Hillel and, uh, synagogues on this call, it really is to that point of our community is looking for um, calls to action um, that are from trusted, trusted sources. And how do you see the Jewish Community Foundation in San Diego positioning itself as that trusted source and connecting people who care about climate to Judaism at the same time? What's the strategy that pulls all of those pieces together? Sure. So I guess we can start by giving a little bit of an intro into Give4. Um, Ollie, do you have the, a slide for that? Or do you want yeah, to give you, a brief and intro? Do you, want, do you want me to do the, the quick one minute on that? Sure. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> I saw the look on your face. Um, so just to take some of those ideas that we just talked about, um, we, we've created this initiative in San Diego called um, the Give for Homelessness in San Diego Fund. And the goal was just to get everybody to participate in the solutions to homelessness in San Diego, Jewish, not Jewish, young, old, everybody. And we've hit on some early success with this. Um, this just launched in August and we've already raised um, $240,000. And so we're raising money at a pace of about 40 or 50K a month and it's been quite consistent. Um, so we kind of feel like we've hit on something. And so the question is, how do we do that? Um, and so what we did was we um, created a fund. We worked with experts in different areas of, uh, with different, ex er excuse me, different experts um, locally on uh, homelessness, as well as people with lived experience of homelessness. That was really important to curate a fund of 12 nonprofits. Um, and so you can just see really quickly, here are those 12 um, nonprofits, we broke them down into three different areas, prevention, intervention, and systems change. So it was curated through a really transparent process. Um, and we make it super easy for anybody who wanted to support this fund to donate um, through you know, a variety of different methods. And then critically, each month we're telling the story um, of a different one of those nonprofits through these little one minute videos that are like super shareable. I'll put a link in the chat in a sec so you can, you can take a look later. 
Uh, but really, we wanted people to see their impact um, every month and be able to tell a, a different story of a different aspect of their giving and how their giving was making a difference. Um, and then we're, we're starting conversations and, and we're really trying to help um, people learn along the way um, about um, homelessness, because it's as much as it's about the fundraising, it's really about um, changing attitudes and changing minds. Um, and so we've, we've, we've really hit on some nice success. Uh, I just threw a bunch of things on the slide here really quickly that, um, uh, you know, should show that we've just had some, some you know, local coverage. Um, it's, and we have a nice following on Instagram and we put out these videos. So I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, but really the, 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 the take homes, um, which I'm happy to, um, and then I'll, I'll hand it back over to Aviva, is really, you know, focusing on just solving a problem, focusing on, you know, what is the issue, not, not getting stuck in the weeds of, um, not, not getting stuck in the weeds of like how the sausage is made or like what the process is, but really focusing on, on, on an issue, um, making it super easy, like low barrier entry points so that people aren't, um, you know, you're not requiring too much of a commitment. You, you bring people in and then see who wants to, um, you know, rise to the top and get really involved, people like Aviva. Um, and then lastly, you know, it, it's not about forming one-way relationships. It's not about just asking for money. Like, how are you bringing people into a conversation? How are you continually engaging people um, and, and allowing the community to go in the direction it wants to go? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so as a young Jewish adult, um, who's new to philanthropy, I saw this Give For model and um, really felt like it was designed um, for me in that it was super curated, really transparent, really easy to give to. And I felt like, oh, this is really tackling all these issues. But for me, the issue that I care most about, as I mentioned, is climate change and wanting others in the community to be able to give as easily to that and make um, tackling climate change in our community feel accessible. So we're taking that model and um, similarly creating a steering committee of local experts on the topic of climate change. And we'll be launching a climate change fund later in 2022 that we hope will catalyze both the Jewish community and young Jewish donors, but also the broader um, donor community. Um, who maybe are starting to awaken to the sense that we really need to tackle this issue, but may not know where to start. So that's really our goal is to provide that um, early entry point for people who are interested in, in engaging with this work. Awesome. I love that. I think the the combination of pieces, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who thinks in Venn diagrams all the time. And I think the combination of all those elements, Ollie, that you talked about, and then you overlap all those circles and like, how do you design for the place that hits on all of those pieces is exactly what's so awesome about this platform. And so it's not surprising to me that you're seeing a lot of engagement, both on your homelessness uh, project and also how exciting it is to be applying those lessons to climate as well. Um, Shana, would you like to talk to us a little bit about your strategy, how you approach this work to be speaking to the priorities of the audience that you're trying to engage and, and what you see really working about getting them involved in, in Jewish life uh, in this issue? Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to just piggyback off of what Ali and Aviva said that really at the core of what we do is just relationship building. It's that about transparency and about trust. Um, and that's what makes um, what we do so accessible to our students. So I really appreciate that you guys brought that up. Um, in terms of college students, some truths about college that I'm sure will come as no surprise to anyone here. It is exciting and eye-opening, and it is also incredibly overwhelming and exhausting. And so for students that commit themselves to so many things, at the end of the day, the last thing that a student wants to do is sit down for another lesson. So the best way that I found to meet this need for my students is to start with the things that they're already seeking out. They want social activities. They want to get outside for fresh air. They want to eat better food than the dining hall is serving. So when we start with those things and then are able to weave in the Jewish and environmental components, it's, it's, it's proving to be a lot more successful. So I'll give a few examples. First, um, I'm sure if any of you have seen a picture of a girl's college dorm room aesthetic, nine out of 10 times, it's gonna involve a succulent. So working with that, right? Tu is coming up, the Jewish birthday of the trees, 
you could meet a group of students in their dorm common room, paint pots, plant a succulent. Maybe you can also include like a brief discussion or a text to accompany it. But if that's not the vibe of the students and they're having a great time painting and potting their succulents, like let it be. And doing this, it allows them to embrace their connection to nature, embrace the Jewish holiday, and then also to interact with each other in a fun, meaningful, relevant way. Second idea that has been successful for us, um, uh, for High Holidays, our Hillel offered a, an experience for students that don't find sitting in services to be the way that they connect to Judaism most. So I led what was called a reverse Tashlich, Tashlich being a Jewish tradition in which it's common to throw pieces of bread or corn into a body of water as a symbol for casting away our sins. So reverse Tashlich, on the other hand, it was put on by an organization called Tikkun Hayam, and we brought a group of students to a body of water to pick up trash. Um, and this allowed students to have the option to engage with the holiday in whichever way felt natural, felt meaningful to them. And it was, again, it was social, it was outdoors, and it was a new way to connect to the holiday that they may not have experienced before. And finally, um, Shabbat. We all at Hilla, we host Shabbat dinners every Friday night. It's lovely, everyone gets to sit around, laugh, have fun, be together. Uh, but there was one instance this past semester in which a student came to me at the end of the meal and said, I'm noticing how much food waste there is. Like, that's really disappointing. So we sit down, we chat, I say, great. Here's who you can contact at our food services department about food waste, go for it. And about a month later, we had a compost bin at every Shabbat meal. And that same student was coming to Shabbat week after week, bringing their friends along and feeling that sense of empowerment and that pride of not only the environmental accomplishment, but the mitzvah that they did for our community. So those are just a few examples of the way that engaging our college students around climate doesn't necessarily need to be a workshop, uh, a lesson plan, a sit down program, right? We can meet their needs, we can meet their moment and what they're looking for while also achieving our goals and getting our messages across. I love it. So you're both walking the walk and demonstrating the values of what you're talking about and empowering people um, I, I love the story about empowering a student to get involved with the university structure and system. And I think that that, that feedback loop is so powerful to have, like, here's an idea as the adults in your life, we're going to help you be successful in taking this on. And then being able to see like, wow, that really made a difference is a great way to build that sense of empowerment and activism. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Laura, I know that your congregation had a very rich and thoughtful process. And in fact, the president of uh, that, that synagogue actually just presented on a decarbonizing webinar an hour ago uh, about the solar panels on the building. Uh, but I know that you did a really great job engaging teens in that whole process. So tell us a little bit about your strategy and how that played out. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and here, as I'm talking about kind of the infinite creative possibilities that exist in a congregational setting to engage teens and engage a wider population in climate justice, uh, I really want to shout out our Road Fate Aesthetic Pursuing Justice team um, because we created these opportunities really um, as a team. And um, I was blown away each time a new idea evolved and then uh, we took action on it. It was a very um, action oriented and continues to be an action oriented um, effort at our synagogue. And to your point, those actions continue today as we're as we're choosing all kinds of exciting um, climate forward opportunities as a synagogue. Um, but to rewind to how we came to climate justice as our central issue, our central area of focus, at least for the last two years of of synagogue engagement, we came to that not just by intuition that, you know, this was a great issue and, and of course we care about it, but we actually did some good old fashioned community organizing. Uh, we had house parties throughout neighborhoods, and this was, of course, before the pandemic, um, but in 2019, we were able to host you know, over a dozen house parties that drew people from all over our synagogue to really hear their stories about um, how their perspectives on the world have been shaped by experiences in their lives. So from the get-go, it was incredibly relational and listening focused. And what rose to the top was that among the many issues that our congregants care about, climate justice um, is one that, that 
draws in the broadest um, under, you know, the broadest cross section of individuals. And when we had a survey that really asked congregants to respond, what am I most likely to take action on and be, a, be involved in and participate, um, particularly from our younger demographics, but also across the board, climate justice rose to the top. Uh, so with that vote of confidence from our community, we did start to envision action and from the get go, we really wanted to engage teen leaders and they weren't hard to find because they were already on the front lines of climate marches in the Bay Area. Um, they were in my office talking to me about climate anxiety and how they were wrestling with that at school and really wanting a positive outlet within their Jewish community where they felt at home to be able to take meaningful steps. Um, and you know, in our mitzvah core and in various social justice programs within the temple that kept coming up in conversation. Um, so the key was to really connect them to meaningful, authentic leadership opportunities and remove whatever barriers were in the way to them being able to participate in a really full way. Um, so from the, we had, a, we had a whole range of opportunities in which teens participated at the very beginning of launching our campaign um, because their voices carried the most weight um, when it came to engaging and exciting the rest of our members. So we had a phenomenal senior Marina uh, speak from the BIMA and really share her experience and bring us some deep Torah about climate justice and also challenge our congregation um, to not leave it to her generation to address this issue together. Uh, we had teens who facilitated a film discussion. This was a really exciting and meaningful opportunity when we had to pivot to a virtual setting um, to still be keeping the conversation going. Um, and they were so clearly the right facilitators for this panel because they were all steeped in climate activism on campus at their high schools and were bringing fresh ideas and really sharp questions to our community that was participating in this film discussion. Um, again, in a virtual setting when we all had to pivot, which is really challenging when you're doing community organizing because it is so relationship based and ideally exists in person in sanctuaries outside. Um, another opportunity that was successful was that we invited teens to be speakers when we did um, we did active, we advocacy to our representatives um, who changed their office to a zoom office and invited our congregation along with a few other congregations in the Bay Area to speak to core issues that we were really invested in and ask them about specific legislation um, that they were working on and what their commitments to climate justice were. So that was a really exciting direct engagement um, that our teens, again, spearheaded. I kind of you know introduced the panel and got out of the way um, because at this moment, they're really, they're teaching me what the way that they want to drive um, the pressure that we put on our politicians, the asks that we're making of our wider community, um, and the ways we're really demonstrating that commitment on a daily basis. And finally, what else do I want to add? I could go on for a while, but another opportunity that was really exciting, um, that was both teen driven and also brought in so many additional members um, at a time when we really needed a lot of uplift, um, was the initiation of a community garden on campus, um, which was a recognition that in addition to the enormous systemic change um, that we are advocating for and agitating for on the local and national level, um, we needed to rededicate and strengthen our commitment to the land we were living on and to the joy that we needed to feel in our sacred spaces. Um, and we were lucky enough to have a few, you know, an, an empty plot of land at PTBE that we could play with, um, but it wasn't much. And from not much, all kinds of expert gardeners came out of the woodwork. We had artists involved um, and our Road Fates Edit Committee has continued to sound the call that this is a place to find joy in community. And this is also a place to demonstrate within our building um, that we're really connected to the earth. We're called to be Shomri Adama, guardians of the earth. Um, and, and with that in mind, we can gather in a safe way outside, plant some seeds, um, which feels really inspirational and needed at this time. Awesome. Thank you. You've done so much. And I just want to observe that across all of your stories, one, you're creating lots of different kinds of on-ramps for people with, as Ali said, like minimal friction, right? Like what is of interest and what is that low barrier to entry on-ramp that leads to 
meaningful work and very actionable change. Um, and lots of different ways to engage with being an active change agent from speaking to elected officials, to giving money, to advocating within a university system for change. And all of those things are incredibly real and make a difference. And they're also training people and empowering them to continue building that kind of empowerment around this issue, which is just, I'm finding teens today are like, so incredible when it comes to this and we should be helping them build those leadership skills and see how to dedicate those skills through the Jewish community um, as well as in these climate spaces as well. Um, I also just want to note, I, I was on a, a session with um, Marshall Gans, who's like just so amazing to learn from um, last night. And he has this um, definition of leadership that I just feel like is apropos of the moment. Um, he says, leadership means taking on the responsibility of creating conditions that enable others to achieve a shared purpose in the face of uncertainty, which I just feel like is exactly what all of you are doing. Taking on the responsibility to create conditions that enable others to achieve a shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. And he talks about how leadership is a practice not a position. So you don't have to be the director of blah, 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 or the CEO of such and such to be in that position of leadership. All of you both are doing this for the young demographics that you're engaging, and you're also teaching them how to do it for their peers, um, which is exactly where collective power comes from. So that's um, amazing stories. Um, I'd love to put one other question to the four of you to respond to, and then we'll take some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. And I want to encourage people to, to feel free to, I mean, the Q&A, feel free to post things in the Q&A um, for our conversation um, in just a moment. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about like the tachlis, the practical change that you're seeing, whether it's on an issue or in your organization or one example of one person who's kind of changed, just like a teeny snapshot of one of those moments of success. And maybe even more importantly, um, what are the tips, like very practical tips that you would give folks who are listening today about how to do this effectively, whether to get started or to refine what they're doing to make it um, more effective? Um, what are those tips that you would pass on? Who would like to go first? Okay, Shana, you're on. Happily. So I would say one of my biggest tips, it's actually something that you have continued to bring up, Lisa, is just to walk the walk um, as engagement professionals, as passionate members of the community, as already engaged students, we have this unique opportunity to to model our practices for everyone else in our environment. And so just like in Judaism, where we don't you know, go to services and then forget that we're Jewish until next Friday night, right? Like in the climate movement and in the climate work, it's the same. We live out our values each and every day and we model that. Um, and so I think for me, just as an example, right? I teach a course on, on climate justice, but every single day on campus, you'll find me walking around with my reusable mug um, staying after programs to clean up containers to be recycled um, at the thrift store on campus to get t-shirts for our tie-dye program, right? Like these things that not only is the, braid, the broader Syracuse community seeing, but my students see me walking around campus. Um, and there was actually really a, a fun interaction this past semester in which I walked into Starbucks for a coffee date and was carrying my cute little Syracuse Hillel travel mug. The student looked at me and said, you know, just like, I didn't know that Starbucks was taking reusables again. Does, does Hill have any extra that I can have? It's like, yes, absolutely. Like, we got this. Um, and so it really goes to show that it's it's about authenticity. It's not just lip service, right? We're, we're showing up every day. We're modeling it. Um, and really, it's simply by living out our values and modeling it for the world. And that's how um, slowly it takes time. But that's how we're going to impact our students and get them engaged and asking questions and wanting to get involved more on their own terms and on their own timeline. That's great. This isn't just one program. This is like has to be part of our DNA 
And I think that's a, a really important point to make and for leaders who are listening today to think about how you can actually make this part of your DNA and have it expressed in all these different aspects um, of your work and your organization is, is really important. And the younger demographics, all of us, but especially the younger demographics are, are listening and watching and uh, they can smell that authenticity or lack thereof very quickly. I appreciate that. Um, Ollie, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, don't have um, too many fixed notions when you go in um, about what, how things should look like or how things should be. So an example is um, we offered a site visit to go to one of these, um, one of the homelessness providers in San Diego. And it was, it was, it was not my idea. And frankly, I, I was like, this isn't what people want to do. And to my surprise, like we now have like kind of give for homelessness groupies who like literally like we like when's the next site visit we want to go learn more we want to go see more we want to do stuff in person and I, I was like I, I, it's a, an outcome I could never have imagined that that's how people would want to engage with this because I thought they just wanted light touch and there are a lot of people that do just want to give and know that the money's going to good places but there are other people that really want to get engaged so the more flexible you can remain the less kind of fixed in your ideas and the more you can let things go in the direction that they organically naturally go, the more likely you are to have success. Great, thank you for that. I also just wanna note that just like all the college girls dorm rooms, Ollie has a really strong succulent game going on in his office. <laughs> um, Aviva, would you like to build on that? Any tips? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I'm starting to see is that um, the topic of climate change is starting to um, break free from this kind of tree hugger or like environmentalist um, section of, of philanthropist or of community members. I think we're finally starting to get to the point where um, our community is seeing that it if whatever your issue that you care about, um, that climate change is going to affect that issue in some way. Um, so I think that that is, that's something promising I'm starting to see. Um, I think in terms of how to engage folks, um, I think um, I've often, I, it's often very scary to just absorb the amount of scary negative information and there is a lot of really positive solutions that are happening um and so i um, trying to point people in those directions um some podcasts that i love is how to save a planet for your daily dose of like positive climate news um or books like all we can save i think those can be really great places to spark some conversations as well such an important point. And, and we've been hearing this in the Jewish Youth Climate Movement sessions all week that there's this real balance of like grief and fear and then also hope and empowerment. Mm -hmm. And we know that this audience that we're talking about feels that grief and fear. And so structuring our engagement work around building hope and building empowerment and feeling that there actually is something to be done that will make a difference and here's the path um, can really be um, effective on a emotional and spiritual level as well as on a cognitive level. And that's ideally what the Jewish community should be really good at and that we should be doing well, which is why this is such a timely uh, and important topic. Um, Laura, Rabbi Laura, more, would you like to build on? Sorry, can I just make one more point? And yeah, please. maybe like Tia Aviva on this as well, which is um, especially when it comes to these big, like intractable, overwhelming issues like um, like homelessness or climate, and, and maybe Aviva can talk more about this to do with climate. Um, thinking local, like there, there's a lot of things where you want to, you know, especially climate, because climate is everywhere um, and, and is universal. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do locally that feels a lot more tangible and a lot more that people can get involved with. So I, I don't know if you, you want to just spend like 30 seconds just talking about how you're thinking about that around climate for San Diego. Sure. Um, I think there's a misconception that because climate change is a global issue, it needs to be tackled on this really far reaching global level. 
Um, and I think there is so much happening on the local level and arguably more can happen on the local level um, because of flexible political spectrums and um, local organizing and movements um, that it's often a really great place to start. So that's really where we're focusing on um, for, the, for the climate fund um, is focusing on what are those local orgs so that we're inviting the San Diego Jewish community who, I, Ollie, if I'm not wrong, have not been huge givers in the environmental climate movement to see, oh, here's how you can get involved in this on a local level. Um, I think the other thing I would just encourage and recommend for young people is to um, get involved in leadership roles in local climate orgs and movements um, and realize that you do have a voice and a something to contribute there. Um, I was invited to join a amazing board uh, or uh, the board of an amazing climate organization and originally felt a bit of an imposter syndrome of like, what do they want with some young person like me? What can I contribute? Um, and I think what's unique about the climate justice movement is how diverse and intersectional and multi-generational it is. And so trusting that and engaging fully in it um, and bringing what, what we can each bring. Fantastic. Um, I suspect, Laura, that you might uh, double down on that in your experience and some tips that you would offer folks organizing in a, in a synagogue setting. What, what would you like to add? Um, yeah, what I want to add in this moment is that when it comes to shaping institutional culture, to empowering teens, to launching a climate justice effort or continuing the efforts that you have going on, um, to trust and listen to the cycles and rhythms of the natural world and understand that there will be slower seasons. There will be seasons to plan and to plant and then seasons to reap the, the joy of efforts and to feel the energy and gratification of having put a lot of effort into climate justice. And there will also be the seasons to mourn and to, you know, to replant from a place of emptiness or barrenness. And that's certainly been true in our efforts. Um, we have so much to be proud of. And also, we're moving through a very intense pandemic. Um, and there, you know, when we, we launched our environmental justice campaign in February 2020 um, and had to enormously pivot from there in what we were hoping for. And some of the blessings that sprung up from that were that, you know, we had teens lead our film series. We had um, opportunities for direct engagement with our public official, you know, our elected officials that we might have had a harder time accessing in a non virtual space. Um, but we also had seasons that felt fallow seasons where we were kind of reassessing what was the best way to engage our members. Um, and in those slower moments, I think that's the time to really invest in cultivating relationships and joy and um, and a sense of meaning, particularly for teens um uh you know who are maybe yearning for and expecting a more instant pace of change um and i relate i run on the impatient side um so, <laughs> so you know in that sense i do feel like checking in with your team leaders and reminding them that this really is making a difference even if the impact is not instantly gratifying um, and even if there are hurdles or there's barriers to reaching um, the highest levels of institutional leadership from the get-go um, we heard a lot of um, oh my gosh not yet oh my gosh the high holidays are coming oh my gosh we can't quite act on solar and then all of a sudden there was an opening and there was an opportunity and the conversation happened and now our board is is um, plunging ahead with solar panels so i think just trusting that the pace of change is not always consistent, neither is the natural world, um, but those those rhythms happen. And in, and in each season you find yourself in, there's different opportunities to engage, to cultivate joy, to cultivate resilience. Awesome, that's great. I think actually you said something I just wanna punctuate a little bit more, which is when we have short attention spans or we want quick feedback loops to help people feel like what they're doing actually is making a difference to encourage them to the next. It's tempting, I find, when we're talking about climate action, to pick smaller things that you can have quick wins on. 
But I think what you just said is really important, which is don't dumb down the action. Keep your standards high about what really makes a difference, right? Decarbonizing your organization, putting solar panels on the building, talking to elected officials, pooling money to make change in your community. Those are big, high, important, like really move the needle kinds of things. But you can also break down those big goals into lots of small steps. So that any of us, whether you're a teenager or middle age or anything, can feel like, oh, here was this step and we did it. Now on to the next one, right? And you can have small feedback loops even in the process of tackling big change. So keeping our eyes on the prize about what actually moves the needle in climate action, but breaking it down into small pieces. Um, super helpful. We have a few questions to entertain in our last minutes. Um, Noam asks for Ollie and Shana, can you talk about bridging the gap between engaging with young Jews who are passionate about climate justice, but might feel uncomfortable engaging with Hillel or other Jewish organizations because of mixed feelings or conflicting emotions about Israeli programming or allegiances? We see often in this demographic, there's some conflicting feelings about those two things. I wonder if it's come up in your work and if you have any suggestions. You wanna go first, Shana? Yeah, I'll start us off and then we can bounce off each other. But I would say we all know that the climate crisis has no boundaries and it's affecting everyone everywhere. And so making that the heart and soul of your programming, um, bringing in different voices or different experiences around the world of people experiencing the climate crisis in different ways is a unique way to highlight that there it is affecting everyone and it is affecting everyone differently um and that we need to have collective action right like it's not going to take just israel to do something for it to make a difference we all need to be a part of this um and it's uncomfortable to have some of those conversations especially in the framework of a religious institution um but i think we need to start having those like those really challenging really difficult conversations um potentially, you know, having that conversation outside, not in the Hillel space might be a good way to get them in a different physical environment so that they're in a better mental space um, to be open and willing to have those conversations, I would say is a really great way to start. Um, but doing something that's hands-on and active and, you know, is making it clear that we all need to be a part of this conversation no matter what. I, I would like going to like the the most difficult part of the the discussion which is like you know how does you know i i don't agree with you on israel so therefore I, i'm not going to like have you be part of the conversation around climate I, I think the reality is there's a there's a tough love component that needs to come in on on both sides of that at some point and say as young adults it's important to learn and understand and internalize that we're not going to agree on everything and we don't have to agree on everything because we all agree on this one issue. This is the thing we're here to talk about, the thing we're here to change. Like in the same family, you don't all agree on everything. In the same workspaces, you don't all agree on everything. In friend groups, you don't agree on everything. So to, to create these like artificial like sort of separations because there's an issue you don't agree on, like people need to, you know, like learn and as part of their growth process, be comfortable with the fact that they don't have to agree on everything to move the needle forward on the things that they do care about. Great, thank you. That was a, a meaty question, Noam. Um, so thank you for those brief but important answers. Um, so as our time is drawing to a close, um, I'm gonna ask you all one closing question that I think is gonna speak to Sheila's question, um, which was really about like, how do we get started? Um, and is super important. Um, so I wanna just, um, share a quote from uh, our opening session on Monday night from the teens um, and college students uh, at the Jewish Youth Climate Movement who said, it's frustrating when people say to our generation, quote, you are the future and you're going to save us, which we've all heard like way too many times, maybe even thought it ourselves. Um, they said it really takes the responsibility of adults that adults are in positions of power and influence now to create the structures and the opportunities to really move the needle. And time is short, like single digit number of years short to make really important change. Um, and they asked adults to 
come to the table and use the power and the resources and the opportunities that we have now to make the change for the world that these young people are going to inherit and to create the spaces for them to speak and act to help be part of those agents of change, even if some of them can't yet vote or don't yet have enough disposable income to be giving sums of money in, in their own philanthropy. Um, so my question to you in closing, super, super brief, because we're very short on time, is, is there one thing, what's the one thing that you're doing to model commitment as an adult? And what's one thing you're doing to support young people uh, to help them feel empowered and make change? Who'd like to go first? Rabbi Laura, you're on. Um, I love this question and I, I'm hearing an echo of one of our teens who specifically said this from the BEMA, like you need to stop putting it on our generation to, to fix things for you. <laughs> um, and with tenderness for that, I think that one effort that I'm really trying to engage in, um, in addition to just appreciating the platform that I have as a rabbi and trying to, uh, you know, take the microphone and then get off the stage as often as I possibly can and offer my platform to a teen who has something articulate and burning to say. Um, that's one thing that I'm doing on a very practical level and trying to uh, engage my peers to do as well because we all win um, when those are the voices that are amplified. Um, and another thing that on a practical level I'm thinking of um, is to continue to pay attention to the spiritual and mental health of our teens because I'm not actually worried that they are engaging on the front lines of this work. I know they are very immersed in this topic. They're, you know, it's, it's present in the schools, it's present at home, it's present online, it's present in synagogue. Um, so to also be cultivating that sense of resilience and self nurture um, as the world is burning, um, which is a really challenging thing to try to hold um, as a young person. So to encourage our teens to, you know, to enjoy the natural world as much as they are also fighting to save it. Awesome. Thank you. Shana, super brief. Yes. Um, I feel as though I'm modeling with just my job right now, honestly, like I did not think that being a Jewish professional and fighting for climate justice was like something that you could do. Um, and here we are. So it's really, I'm modeling just by making this a career, showing that it's possible to, to make your passion something that you can, you can love, you can be passionate about it, you can be good at it, and you can get paid for it too. Um, and I think the other thing, um, the second question was something that I'm doing to empower them to be powerful. Um, I would say just listening, like just listening to what they have to say, validating what they have to say, um, and just being that that person to listen and support them. Um, that's the best thing that we can do right now. Great. And I see you being a connector to other people that can make those influences happen. Aviva. Yeah. Um, I think what I'm doing is trying to use my volunteer time to carry out my values and my passion for this this issue that I care deeply about and um, be, being really mindful about how, how I show up in those spaces. Um, and I think that in and of itself is a model to others in our community. Awesome. And I also see you finding structures that are replicable. And I think that's an important message to everybody here. Part of the reason we're doing this entire festival is so you can see the best of case studies and models around the country and replicate those things as opposed to having to create them from scratch yourself that'll hopefully be easier and more efficient and and more actionable um ollie would you like to bring us home with your thoughts yeah i um i would just say um in my own life it, it's honestly about having conversations like just continually like having conversations and maybe like challenging people's thoughts cha people challenging their views and and leaning into some of the discomfort um and then with in terms of engaging younger folks it's just about getting feedback it's like constantly like reality checking along the way and making sure that your own ideas aren't like off base so that's uh, that's how i practice it awesome thank you all for sharing your wisdom and for the great questions that came in through the chat um i think this is such an important issue and in my my venn diagram mind the Jewish community and our values and rootedness in helping to make the world a better place 
and our current climate crisis and the need for action there are the perfect intersection for engaging younger demographics in meaningful change in the world and matching that with Jewish values and doing it through Jewish organizations to build those relationships and feel part of an active, inclusive, values-driven community. So I hope you all will feel inspired to do that in your own work and please feed back to us. If you're continuing to work on this, whether you're just getting started, having early successes, or have an amazing case study to share at next year's festival, um, please feel free to be in touch with us. And this session and all the others are on Facebook immediately if you want to go back and listen to the decarbonizing one from earlier today or any of the youth sessions that have happened. The fossil freedom one about endowments, retirement funds, and donor advised funds is also great. And they'll all be up on YouTube on our YouTube channel shortly. Thank you so much for being part of the Big Bull Jewish Climate Fest. Have a great day.